All right, internet, let's get our game on. Today, I want to talk about the Sacred Beast Monsters and the Egyptian God Cards, and how the Sacred Beast Monsters are related to the Egyptian God Cards. Now, just so we're all on the same page, the Sacred Beast Cards are a series of high-level monsters that play a prominent role during the events of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. Throughout the show's first season, their revival is foreshadowed as a world-ending calamity, an event that must be prevented at all costs. But when their inevitable summoning occurred during the season's conclusion, fans across the globe couldn't help but notice the similarities between these monsters and the Egyptian god monsters seen throughout Duel Monsters. Each of the sacred beasts appears to be a counterpart to one of the Egyptian gods, with Raviel, Lord of Phantasms, mirroring Obelisk the Tormentor, Uriah, Lord of Searing Flames, matching up with Slifer the Sky Dragon, and Haman, Lord of Striking Thunder, paralleling the Winged Dragon of Ra. But despite visually and mechanically paralleling the Egyptian gods, the sacred beasts are never explicitly said to be connected to them in any way. In fact, the show doesn't really tell us much about them at all. For all we know, this is just one big cosmic coincidence. Well, when I started researching this video, I found some fascinating clues. And I think that there are enough bits of info scattered throughout Dual Monsters and GX that we can put together a semi-probable explanation. So let's review what we do know about them and see if we can connect the dots. We know that thousands of years before the modern day, sorcerers in ancient Egypt participated in dark rituals known as the Shadow Games, in which they bound the spirits of monsters from other dimensions and forced them to battle against spirits conjured by their opponents. While thousands of spirits were bound during this period in history, there were none more powerful than the three gods, Obelisk the Tormentor, Slifer the Sky Dragon, and the Winged Dragon of Ra all of whom bestowed their powers upon the pharaohs of Egypt, giving them the power to rule over and defend the nation from its foes. During the war between the pharaoh Atem and Zork Necrophades, the combined power of the gods was all that prevented the Shadow Games from spiraling out of control and wiping out humanity. So the pharaohs sealed away all of the bound monster spirits using the power of the Millennium Items, the god spirits, and his own name, in order to prevent them from ending the world. Thousands of years later, Maximilian Pegasus unearthed their archaeological remains and learned of the Shadow Games from the spirit guardian Shadi, who bestowed the Millennium Eye upon him. Pegasus used this relic to resurrect the Shadow Games in the form of the modern game of Duel Monsters, but when he began working on creating copies of the Egyptian God Monsters, everyone involved in the project died mysteriously, except for Pegasus himself, who was only shielded from the wrath of the gods because he possessed a Millennium Item. The pharaoh, who had returned from the land of the dead, eventually took possession of all three god cards and used them to save the world from Zork once again. Their millennia-long battle finally at its end, the pharaoh and the gods departed the land of the living, making for their eternal rest in the world beyond. Unfortunately, we know significantly less about the sacred beasts. We do know that like most of the early Duel Monsters cards, they were based on monsters carved on ancient tablets discovered during archaeological expeditions in Egypt, with these monsters in particular being discovered by a man named Lyman Banner, who uncovered them while researching the art of alchemy. We also know that at some point, the sacred beasts were manufactured as a single set of playing cards, which ended up in the hands of Banner's associate, Kagemaru, who proceeded to bury them on a remote island where he later co-founded the institution of Duel Academy. The reason that Kagemaru did this was because the sacred beasts appeared to be incomplete when their cards were first manufactured. Unlike the god cards, which could go around killing people before they were ever printed, the sacred beasts needed to be charged up using dueling energy. So Kagemaru set a convoluted scheme in motion. First, he buried the cards on the island beneath the seven spirit gates, which didn't actually do anything. Then he manufactured the seven spirit keys, but they didn't actually do anything either. Then he helped set up Duel Academy on the island to train professional duelists and gave the spirit keys to the school's headmaster, Chancellor Shepard, telling him that he needed to protect them so that no one could release these terrible, horrible, awful monsters and use them to conquer the world. It was then up to Shepard to distribute the keys to duelists capable of defending them. At the same time, Kagemaru hired a gang of criminal duelists known as the Shadow Riders, including Lyman Banner, who just so happened to be hired as a professor at Duel Academy. The Shadow Riders were then sent out to challenge the Spirit Key's protectors in the hopes that the clash between the Key Guardians and the Shadow Riders would provide enough dueling energy to power up the Beast cards. This would then allow Kagemaru to swipe in and recollect them for himself once their batteries were maxed out. 
which is exactly what happened. And that's pretty much all that we know about their history. Most of what we learn is about what Kagemaru did to obtain their power, but we know basically nothing about where that power came from, both in terms of its ancient past and in terms of how the cards were manufactured. And like I already said, there's no obvious explanation for why they look like the Egyptian god monsters. But some of these plot elements are based off of real world history and mythology, so let's start by looking there. Professor Banner first uncovered the Sacred Beast tablets while researching the ancient art of alchemy. Now, alchemy means a lot of different things to a lot of different cultures, but generally speaking, it falls somewhere between religion, magic, and science, and is based on the writings inscribed on an ancient artifact known as the Emerald Tablet. And wouldn't you know it, Professor Banner happens to carry a shadow charm known as the Emerald Tablet. And most alchemists worked in pursuit of the goal of finding the secret to immortality. Again, this lines up with Banner's portrayal in GX, as he tried to use alchemy in order to extend his own life after he became sick. His research allowed him to create a second body for his spirit to occupy, meaning alchemy has the ability to create corrupted doppelgangers, false representations of beings that already exist. And what are the sacred beasts if not false representations of the Egyptian gods? Phantom versions of the gods. And how's that for coincidence? Because before 4Kids went ahead and decided to throw out all the actual Japanese translations of GX while they were localizing it for American audiences, these monsters were referred to as the three phantasms. So, this might suggest that someone, somewhere, somehow, used the art of alchemy to create homunculus phantasm versions of the Egyptian god monsters resulting in the birth of the sacred beast monsters seen throughout GX. But who would do such a thing, and why? Well, I think that the answer to that lies in a subtle clue in the names of each sacred beast monster. We all know that the Egyptian god monsters are named after elements of real-world Egyptian mythology. The winged dragon of Ra is named for the sun god, Ra. Obelisk the Tormentor is named for the Obelisk Monument, which represents the real-world myth of the god Atem and the Egyptian creation story. And Slifer the Sky Dragon, which was actually called Osiris the Heavenly Dragon before being intentionally mistranslated into English, is named for the god of the underworld, Osiris. Similarly, the sacred beasts are all named for angels appearing in the Hebrew scriptures. Raviel is named for the angel Raziel, the angel of secrets or mysteries. Uriah, Lord of Searing Flame, is named after the angel Uriel, who is known as both God's Flame and the Angel of Death. And if you look at the Yu-Gi-Oh wiki, it actually equates Haman as being a parallel to Haman, a man who tried to exterminate the Hebrew population of Persia in the Book of Esther in the Tanaka, the Hebrew Bible. But I actually think that this is a mistake, as I did find a couple of sources stating that the name is an alternative spelling of the angel Gabriel, who serves as God's messenger. And this actually makes a little bit more sense. You see, the names Raziel and Uriel both translate to declarations about God, with the name Raziel translating to God is my teacher, and Uriel meaning God is my light. The Hebrew word Haman, derived from the Persian villain, breaks this trend, as it loosely translates to the word noisy or tumultuous. But the name Gabriel, on the other hand, translates to God is my strength, keeping in continuity with the other two angelic names used here. Furthermore, Yu-Gi-Oh is a Japanese property, and Haman is also a Japanese word, referring to the serrated pattern on a sword that appears during the hardening or strengthening process. This lines up with both Gabriel's name being a reference to strength and this card's serrated visual design. So while the connection between the names Haman and Gabriel is obscure, it thematically lines up really well with the other angels being referenced here and the monster's visual design. All of this to say, the three sacred beast cards appear to have roots in a fictional version of Judaism, the same way that the god cards were rooted in a pseudo version of Egyptian mythology. But here's what stands out to me. There is a story in the Hebrew scriptures that not only takes place in Egypt, but where all three of these particular angels play a role. In the book of Exodus, which is both in the Jewish Torah and the Christian Old Testament, the Hebrew population in Egypt lives in servitude. The prophet Moses, a Hebrew man who was taken in by the Egyptian royal family as a baby, flees Egypt when he discovers his Hebrew heritage. While in the desert, an angel of the Lord appears before Moses in the form of a burning bush to convey God's orders that he return to Egypt. 
As the messenger of God, this responsibility would have fallen to the angel Gabriel. Moses later confronts his adoptive brother Ramses and his sorcerers by performing several miracles. The angel Raziel is considered to be the keeper of all magic, the agent of God who sponsors the miracles performed by human beings. And then Uriel, as the angel of death, is believed to have killed the firstborn son of each Egyptian family as punishment when Ramses refused to free Moses' people. The story even supports the idea that the sacred beast monsters were created by means of alchemy. The real-world 5th century Greek historian, Zosimos, wrote that the Hebrew people learned the secrets of alchemy in Egypt and later spread the practice to the rest of the world after their exodus. So the idea that these angelic spirits from that belief system might exist and be related to the practice of alchemy in Yu-Gi-Oh! feels like we're on the right track. So, extrapolating all of this information, I propose that Hebrew alchemists created homunculus phantasm versions of the Egyptian god monsters in order to rise up and defend themselves from their former masters. And if the angels in Exodus actually are dual monster spirits, their power would have been necessary in order to stand against the old pharaoh and the Egyptian gods. The historical timing of this even works out really well. The story in the book of Exodus is believed to have taken place somewhere around the year 1300 BCE. So if a version of those events did occur in the world of Yu-Gi-Oh, it would have occurred about 300 years between the battle between Atem and Zork. And since the real-world mythology of the Egyptian gods predates this time period by at least 1500 years, we can assume that the Shadow Games had been going on for about that long, meaning that the Hebrew people would have been present in Egypt while the Egyptians were playing their Shadow Games, and, very likely, participated in the Shadow Games themselves. This still leaves one major question unanswered though, and that is how the Sacred Beasts came to be printed in the modern day. How did these monsters go from being stone tablets to a set of usable dual monsters cards? Well, we know that creating new cards is actually something of a process. Pegasus needed to use the Millennium Eye in order to manufacture the game in the first place. In GX, Aster Phoenix's manager comments on how much money and research went into developing the ultimate Destiny hero, Destiny and Dragoon. And by the time we get to Arc 5, the Leo Corporation has scientists researching how to generate and perfect pendulum monsters. This isn't something that just anyone can do. In fact, during the GX era of the series, there are only two companies known to be producing Dual Monsters cards. Pegasus's company, Industrial Illusions, and the Kaiba Corporation. I think it's probably safe to say that Pegasus didn't manufacture the Sacred Beast cards himself. During the original series, we learn that after everyone Pegasus had assigned to develop the Egyptian god cards was killed, Pegasus finished the cards but tried to lock them away, fearful that their power would ever be unleashed upon the world at large. After that horrifying experience, he never attempted to produce any further copies of the god cards, and I doubt he would have been interested in pursuing any monsters that could rival them in terms of power. And let's just take a second to play Six Degrees of Separation. We know that the Sacred Beast tablets themselves were discovered by Professor Banner, and the cards eventually ended up with Kagemaru. Not only did Banner work as one of Kagemaru's Shadow Riders, but he was also a professor at Duel Academy, the school that Kagemaru owned and co-founded. And who co-founded Duel Academy with him? Yeah, Seto Kaiba. During the events of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, we learn that Kaiba has been experimenting with creating new Duel Monster Spirits. Jaden duels against the Kaiba Man monster spirit, which can only be described as an immortalized narcissism complex, and we learn in Season 2 that Kaiba created Jaden's Neospatian monsters and elemental hero Neos by shooting young Jaden's car designs into space where they could pass through a magic space anomaly. Plus, in another video, I discussed the idea that Kaiba was actually responsible for developing synchro monsters as well. Link to that in the description. We also know that Duel Academy is a bastion of Duel Monsters related research, with an on-campus lab dedicated to card game related animal experimentation, while the students themselves unwittingly act as test subjects in a variety of schemes. So is it really a stretch to believe that Banner revealed the Sacred Beast to Kagemaru, who in turn convinced Kaiba to help him manufacture a set of cards? For Kaiba, it would have represented a second chance at reclaiming power the likes of the Egyptian god cards, which he'd lost to Yugi almost a decade prior. But of course, the two of them would have run into a problem. Pegasus needed a Millennium Item to power up the god cards, but Kaiba wouldn't have had anything like that on hand for the Sacred Beasts. 
So in order to power the cards, he needed to find a way to generate enough dueling energy to get them going. Thus, he and Kagemaru founded the Duel Academy, where their students would duel each other until their new super cards turned on and Kaiba could finally become the world's number one duelist. The real question at that point is who would double cross who? Battle City Kaiba would never have been content to share the Egyptian God cards, and I doubt the GX era Kaiba would be any more willing to share the power of the Sacred Beasts. Similarly, Kagemaru's plans required all three cards for himself. Kagemaru ultimately won because however fast the cards were charging up, he accelerated the plan by sending in the Shadow Riders to duel the Key Guardians, meaning that he could make his move before Kaiba ever realized that the cards were ready for use. So in summary, the Sacred Beast Monsters are a series of homunculus phantasm clones of the Egyptian god monsters created by Hebrew alchemists and inhabited by the spirits of three Hebrew angels so that a Yu-Gi-Oh version of the prophet Moses could stand up against his people's oppressors and lead the Hebrew exodus from Egypt, which eventually led to the Sacred Beasts being discovered by a modern alchemist, whose buddy Kagemaru then brought them to Seto Kaiba, who helped them start a professional card game prep school in the hopes of using their students in illegal card game experiments that would harvest enough card game power to power up their card game cards in the hopes of ruling the world, but Kagemaru double-crossed Kaiba, stealing the cards for himself before being squarely defeated in his first and only duel with them, thus sealing the Sacred Beasts away once again and saving the world. It's just that simple. And can I just say that when I started researching this video, I had no idea it was going to end with Yu-Gi-Oh! Moses. But I won't lie, I would watch the absolute hell out of a new Yu-Gi-Oh anime set in Egypt where Moses has to become an alchemist and tame the spirits of the sacred beasts so that he can return to his brother's court and square off against the Egyptian gods. That sounds way better than Go Rush. But what do you think about the history of the sacred beasts? Is this really where they came from or am I getting crazier with every batshit video? Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and be sure to hit the subscribe bell thing so that you never miss another new video. I've got some more crazy theories coming down the pipeline and you don't want to miss those. I'm going to get back to working on that, and in the meantime, why don't you check out some of the other theories on this channel. Everybody stay safe and stay healthy, and I will catch you in the next video. Bye!